Hey, this is Eddie Spaghetti from the greatest rock and roll band in the world, the Super Suckers. Hey, this is Joe from the Mises. This is Adam Franklin from Slow Driver. This is Artie Lang from the Howard Stern Show. Hey, this is John from the Fag. Hey, this is Rick Kubik, drummer from Natterone. This is Josh Hayden from Spain. Matt Sharp from The Rentals, and you are listening to... And you're listening to The Dark Stuff Podcast. And you're listening to The Dark Stuff Podcast. The Dark Stuff Podcast. <laughs> Sorry it took so long, we, we had, for 25 years, we had a war group debate. Unresolved. We'll play some old shit if that's alright. Hey everyone, it's me, Dave Splash from thedarkstuff.com and the Dark Stuff Podcast. I'm here with episode 110. I'm referring to this show as the Replacements Roundtable. Let me explain. A little while ago, I got this idea that I wanted to discuss the replacements for union, so I put a little message out there on Facebook amongst my friends, uh, asked if anyone who had seen the show would be interested in participating in some sort of group discussion. Got a couple of guys to participate, uh, so the uh, people you'll be hearing in this week's episode besides myself are Chip Duden, Mark Manor, and Joel Hendrickson. These are all guys who are... Uh, Men about town in Omaha, scenesters as you will to some degree. Three of us are in our 40s. Uh, one of us is in our early 20s, so we got a little bit of a difference in age perspective going on there. Chip and myself had seen the replacements in their original incarnation, so we had uh, a little bit of commentary on that. Mark and Joel, their first experience seeing the replacements was at the reunion shows last year at Riot Fest. So again, we're all coming at it from different places. We were originally going to do this discussion on Tuesday, June 2nd. I'm sorry, Tuesday, June 3rd, which happens to be the same night as the Guided by Voices show. We thought, hey, that'll be perfect, right? We'll get together. We'll have a couple of drinks. We'll talk about the replacements, get a little sloshed, head over to the replacement show. Uh, I'm sorry. See, there I go again. Head over to the Guided by Voices show and make a whole night of it. Unfortunately, Mother Nature didn't cooperate, and we had torrential rains. We had flash flooding. We had uh, tornado warnings and all this kind of stuff, so we had to call off that part of it. Uh, I did go to the Guided by Voices show, by the way. I wasn't going to miss that. So we rescheduled it for this Tuesday, June 10th. We held it at the Barley Street Tavern, which is a bar in Benson in Omaha, just a little bit off of Maple Street. And um, I don't know. I think it's a great discussion. I think if people like this and it goes well, I'll, we'll be potentially doing this for some other artists. Um and so let's just go ahead and get it started. This is us, uh, the four of us guys, talking about the first time that we heard the replacements. Hope you enjoy this. This is the Dark Stuff Podcast. Now the four of us are here to do a discussion here on the replacements. Focusing a little bit on the replacements reunion because that's something that we all experienced as well. went to various shows. Um, but I want to get the, the ball rolling with just sort of going, telling kind of your own personal replacements story. So I thought, i just ask everybody when was the first time they heard it, they could relay the experience. And I'll start because I have a very vivid memory of it. I was probably like 15 or 16, and I went to Homer's in the uh, 132nd, or Orchard Plaza, the old Homer's. Mike uh, uh, Fratt may have been working there as a very young Mike Fratt, but I'm not 100% sure on that part. I was a total metal kid, and I used to go into, I used to ride my bike to Homer's all the time and buy Motley Crue, Rat, whatever, and whatever was coming out. And I was a big Kiss fan. And I walked in, and there's a band playing. I don't recognize it. And the next song is them covering Black Diamond. So, of course, I'm immediately like, what the fuck is this, right? So I go running over to the front. They show me what the record is. I just buy it on site because I'm like, I figure, whatever. If these guys cover the cover Kiss, then they must be pretty good. I took it home. And I hated the rest of it. I just couldn't stand it. I thought it was all terrible besides that song. But slowly over the next, like, six months, it became my favorite album. And then I realized I had missed Tim because it had already been out. Got into Please to Meet Me. And that was kind of where it began. And it, it started to slowly change my whole perspective on music because the old hair metal stuff didn't cut it after that. Like, I, I started seeing things in kind of a different way. Um, 
And I credit that experience of walking in at that time at Homer's, hearing that song queue up on the turntable. If, I, if it had been on side two already by the time I got there, like I probably never would have heard it, or maybe years later would have. That's my story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, m- mine's kind of similar to that. I mean, I'm a little older than you, so I actually, it was 84, I believe. That, that's when Let It Be came out, right? Mm-hmm. So, 84. So, um, I grew up a Kiss fan as well child of the 70s, you know, and getting the first KISS concert when I was 12 years old and in Pershing Auditorium and stuff, and, um, you know, grew up with Aerosmith, Zeppelin, Sabbath, that kind of environment, and then went to college, and there's, uh, had a bad year, like my freshman year, because I was, I was the freshman social chairman, and girls liked some really bad stuff, and I was always prone to play whatever they wanted to, but anyway, so... Then I turned 20, and there was a, I remember there was, uh, within a couple months of each other, Rolling Stone reviewed, like, two different albums that both kind of really set the tone for a lot of my musical interests to follow. And then so that was kind of my first experiences from reading a couple of reviews in Rolling Stones and the Beat Farmers and then the replacements, and that's what kind of got me going on them. And then seeing them, I think, later that year at the Drumstick when they came out was their first appearance. Oh, you don't even you don't even, I haven't heard the name of the Beat Farmers in like a really long time. I've heard about them in like Waddle Canal Diary. That was, yeah, there was that whole. Bands from that period. Kind of cow, cow punk, you know, kind of is what they called it back they then. You know, there's some really yeah. cool stuff, yeah. All right, Mark. My story is a little bit different. It's a little bit in reverse. It's similar to yours, in which I grew up listening to Rat and Molly Crew and, you know, all that hair metal and, and metal like Dokken and Dio and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there was a time where I started really, you know, becoming exposed to different music, you know. Unfortunately, like, the Indigo Girls were one of them that brought me out, which is really strange, and R.E.M. and things like that. And I remember buying the Say Anything soundtrack, which is pretty much not even really, it's, it's a replacement to name, you know. But it's not even really, it's just Westerberg at the very end for the most part. But, you know, within your reach, you know, and I just love that song. And pretty much anything off that soundtrack, I, just, I forgot that was that's how I just, Yeah, I just, that's how I discovered them and Fishbone and, wow. um, you know, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were on there and Depeche Mode. And so I, I use that soundtrack as almost a starting point to really discover a lot of artists. And so, you know, then over the years, you know, just working at Homer's, you know, I, you know, playing replacements, you know, we, you know, my friend Chad was really into them. Who uh, went with me and Joel to see the replacements out? And, uh, I think you have to like the replacements to work in a record store in the eighties or nineties. Yeah. Uh, sort of a requirement. Staple of college radio. <laughs> so that ended up be, being band. it was it ended up being Chad's favorite band. He got super super obsessed with them, and so whenever we were on road trips or anything, I mean it was replacements, 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 and so I you know obviously fell in love with them too. So. All right, Joel, you're up. I was so I'm the. I want to know what the kid, how the kid got into it. That's <laughs> yeah, my big curiosity. Through Mark, I think we shared enough of it on Facebook, and then um, also interesting enough of my Coachella experience, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, Billy Joe Armstrong. I used to, I grew up listening to Green Day, so and he always kind of cited the replacements as uh, influence. So um, and then through that kind of. Well, what are you doing here? What is Billy Joe doing here? really do come true. <laughs> we'll see about that. Reunited, so it got me kind of excited around the whole replacement story and the, the whole mythology yeah. behind it. And yeah. So that's what it was. I mean, that's what it was too. It was so you you don't you never hear replacements fans strictly talking about the music. There's always a story behind it because everywhere they went there's a story to that story uh, almost in the old days I mean eventually it became sort of all the shows were sort of the same and all that but um, well let's talk about um, how many times you've seen them and if you have like the first time and just maybe the best experience now we'll break up the order this time and go with Mark okay well I've only seen them once which is okay. last year because I found them you know Pretty much as they were, as they were, ending. you know, ending as a band, and I will be going to see them in 
September in, in, in Minnesota on their homecoming show with Mr. Duden here. Absolutely. So, um, so that was my best time. So that was the one and only time. Okay. Um, did you see any solo shows like Paul sure. Solo or Tommy? Or, saw or Paul Westerberg at the Ranch Bowl, of course. Hung out on his tour bus with him, although I was a little more obsessed with his drummer at the time, which was... Michael Bland, who was Prince's drummer, so I oh, ended up. Oh, he's the guy who's in Soul Sound now. Right? He's in Soul Sound yeah. now, and so I ended up really <laughs> kind of a huge Prince fan. So you know, while I, you know, I had my you're a Prince fan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so while I had my words with Westerberg and got autographs and all that, I really just focused in on, on Michael Bland on that. See, that, bus, that surprises you know? me that he allowed that. I mean, because he always had that persona of just we were, being we edgy were and kind of a prick. You yeah, know? we so. were shocked. He was, yeah, he was. He was great that night. He was very open with us, you know, just... That's cool. He let us on the bus and handed us drinks, and um, I've seen Tommy Stinson a couple times um, at the Ranch Bowl. I've seen... Uh... All right, let's go with Chip. Um, yeah, so I think I think it was 84 was the first time they came around to the to the drumstick, the legendary drumstick in Lincoln. Which... So you actually saw the Max when they really were Yeah, absolutely, Max. yeah. You know, and that was... I remember going to see him, and they're our age, you know, which I thought was really cool. And then they they get up on stage, and I remember, you know, Tommy getting on his hands and knees behind Bob, and Paul coming up and shoving Bob over backwards behind him, and <laughs> goes tumbling almost off the stage with his guitar. And that was, to me, that kind of like just sums up who they were. You know, they were at the time they were just kind of like snotty kids, you know, and then they proceeded to kind of rip through a set that had partial covers that they wouldn't finish and drunkenness and I just absolutely loved it at the time you know and then you know like Mark said everything's kind of a blur but you know I think I saw him a couple times at the drumstick and I, I think they played the student union one time when I saw him too when they were kind of getting commercial and I'm, I'm trying to think if that was like Slim Dunlap Slim Dunlap well Slim Dunlap. came in pleased to meet me for 87 yeah so it probably would have been right around that time I'm That's guessing that was Slim I saw it up he's yeah. got out of clicks yeah it was Slim I saw yeah it was and then uh, saw him at Peony Park too and I, I'll be honest with you I don't know if that was the 87 because I think they played there a couple times and I think they played it was, there all from pleased to meet me to the end, they kept playing Peony Park. Yeah, so I know I saw him at least one time there with Slim, you know, and I and you know, I moved to Atlanta in '89. So depending on when Atlanta was, I don't know when it was in '89. But yeah, so I probably saw him, you know, four times yeah. back in the day, and then uh, went up to Riot Fest last year in Chicago, which was a good experience. Other than the torrential rain pour and you know, yeah. mud and everything <laughs> got, else that went right along with that. it. Yeah. I didn't. I know what about uh, any of the solo guys? You've seen Paul no, you know, I saw Tommy at uh, the Ranch Bowl in, was it 2002 you know, like, maybe, like something like that? one third of the crowd that was there at that two It was, yeah, that was not well attended like at all. Yeah. Tommy Stinson? Yes. Yeah. The Bash and Pop album I thought was really good, mm-hmm. his Bash and Pop stuff, yeah. if you yeah. remember that. No, yeah, and it was real, that's a real nice pop sensibility and, you know, showed he had some talent too, I think. But never, you never saw Westerberg solo? No, never saw Westerberg solo. Uh, never saw any other guys. There was no Slim? No. The couch. Yeah, and Billy Joe playing uh, lead guitar and singing. And so how, was that? how was that? Because like I've seen some videos of it, and part of me thinks it's cool because Billy Joe Armstrong is a big rock star, and he does have a younger following, and maybe that'll transfer some people who are younger to be like, oh, why is this bunch, this bunch of old guys that he's playing with? Who are these guys? And kind of look into it. But I don't even know if people do that anymore. I mean, it's kind of how it was for me initially. Like I said, Billy Joe kind of cited him, replacements as an influence on his music, um, I guess, early on. And um, so that it was really cool to see him play with them and kind of, uh, like Chip alluded to, like Paul just lay there on the couch just having a great time, not really now was, was he was, was Armstrong up there the whole set? Um, I would say... 80% of the set, yes. And they still had the other guitar player, too. Uh, yeah. She's all alone about She's all alone Stacks up the eye Big deal, you get to fly She ain't up above You ain't nothing but a waitress in the sky We can have Bob hold up here in an instant, buddy. We ain't nothing, this whole thing.
that van 17 years. Longer than he was ever in the replacement. Right. Right. He's more of a fixture and, in that. And than longer than Duff McKagan was even in Guns N' Roses. So it's sort of like, crazy. it's hard to kind of hold that against him. You know, even though I, I like Guns N' Roses, but I mean, I just, I think it's always been strange to me that he was in that. Well, up until the, you know, the replacement for you, and that was his paycheck, you know. I mean, that, right. that, that kept him off of I think he was listed as musical yeah. director, too, for the band. Oh, he right. was. Yeah. yeah, he was like in charge of the game. Well, you know, because they don't <laughs> rehearse with Axl Rose. That's the weirdest thing, is that they rehearse as a band, and then Axl's like separate. I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't get that, but frankly, so like Tommy's in charge of the band when the band is rehearsing. It's like the band. It's Whatever. Weird. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's, it's it's pretty ridiculous. So when you were seeing, was there a small crowd for them, and then did the crowd come over once they felt like Billy Joel Joel was up there? That, yeah, and that, like the whole theme of Coachella is all these different guests. Right. Like Pharrell brought out Jay Z and Usher, but so you could sense that tweets started getting out that Billy Joel started them. But initially, it was probably 20, 30 people in a row, and then. A real empty area even in front of the sound booth. Or, well, the uh, the first house. weekend, too. I mean, there was like three, four hundred people, is what I read. And you know, first it's week, first yeah. in Coachella, right? Yeah. There's like three, four hundred people, yeah. which, I uh, believe that. you know, the I day mean, glow kids, you know, it's Coachella is a different oh, it's, kind of it is. thing. Not, well, you know? I also saw Riot Fest, I forgot to mention that, but um, the Riot Fest was packed as fuck at Chicago. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I mean, I was in the VIP yeah. section, which was not very VIP at all. No. It was really pretty shitty, and it was over to the side, and it was not really uh, that great. But I got there super early. I skipped the Pixies, who were on, like, the far stage, so I could stand there through the AFI or some shit and get there so that I would, oh, they were awful. Yeah. <laughs> so I could be there in time to get close up for the replacements, and uh, it was awesome. I was very glad I went, but that place was packed. And there were some serious replacements fans uh, at that show. I mean, we were, I was there for two hours waiting, you know, uh, with my friend and, and chatting it up with every single person who was there. Almost all from out of town. I don't think I saw you there, did I? Don't, we, no, didn't cell, we didn't get cell service in there, yeah. so we were going to, like, meet at the place and text, try to figure out where we're at. And then I, I got no signal on my phone yeah. the whole time. I randomly bumped into Aaron Shaddy there. I don't know if you know Aaron from Maha yeah, Festival. Yeah, we had the other Maha yeah. guys with us over there. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we, we were in the same VIP section, and it was just <laughs> packed. And so, you know, my wife, who's 5'4", didn't exactly have the best view. <laughs>
for me it's let it be you yeah. know I mean that was that was the one for me you know and I, I just even still even still yeah that's the one if I'm gonna throw it on I, I like to that's the one I like to listen to I really do let it be let it be I go back and forth between Tim and Pleased to Meet Me even though let it be was what I heard first I really like it felt like I, I finally like was into the replacements as you know like a little bit later like I think by the time Pleased to Meet Me came around it was a little bit I had friends that liked them too it was like party music it was something like that for, for me I'm going to go with Pleased to Meet Me I'm going to go with Pleased to Meet Me even though that's not the original lineup I really like Tim as well, but I just, the production value on that album I could never get over. I mean, it was just kind of I mean, like Faster Than Young is still one of my yeah. favorite anthems, it was and very, it was just very thin. Yeah, just, I don't know how it got like that. Favorite album, Please to Meet Me. Please to Meet Me. It's just nonstop uh, hits on that. One, yeah, you know, it blows by a little fast, but it's just great. And I mean, that's like that's even more raw than Tim, and the whole thing was like. Well, they got rid of Bob because they wanted to be like more serious or something like that, and then they come out with Please to Meet Me, which just seemed like a whole lot less serious, you know? But I don't know, that was my thing. Um, was that all Slim's playing on that record, or was that still... Slim was not on the record. Slim's not on the record, right? He, I mean, that was they all... Yeah, they, it was all Paul and all the That's what I thought, yeah. yeah. So I think that's probably one of the reasons it was a little And then rough. supposedly the symphonic stuff on Can't Hardly Wait was done after they left the studio thinking that the sessions were over, and Jim Dickinson put that stuff on. And apparently Westberg's been pissed ever since, but I think it's cool. Which what's that? Uh, the, the end of Can't Hardly Wait. With oh, okay. like this, the extra production, the string. I mean, they pulled the Beatles "Let It Be" on them. You know, you know what I do? I, I remember now that I, I do remember seeing the student union because I remember being like right up in the front row, and I remember. It seems like Paul. I mean, that was kind of a time where the major label was starting to push him a little bit, and so I remember standing right up front there, and he was playing an answering machine, and I, just, and I was like a, just a horrible hack guitar player, and just kind of looking and trying to figure out in my drunkenness how he was playing that song, and <laughs> never did figure it out. So now that's my favorite song, answering machine. Yeah, favorite song is answering. There, there's an urgency to it that I and, and I, I love. It. It's just hitting the guitar, and it's just got such an edge to it. Yeah, yeah, no, that song. is an amazing song. Not my favorite, though. That'd be tough to say. I'm IOU. IOU. Let me think here. I don't know. That's a good one. Yeah, Answer Machine is up there. I like I Will Dare because it's just pure pop perfection. Yep. Um, I like Bastards of Young because I really like the whole meaning behind it. Yep. Um, I like Here Comes a Regular because I know people like that. And I've known them ever since I was in college, and that's a very relatable thing. So I don't know. I guess I'll, I'll, stay, I'll go with I Will Dare, even though I've probably changed my mind in 10 minutes. But. <laughs> Whatever song's playing. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Um, have you ever met him? Any of the, any of the members? Just Tommy at the at that 2004 show. He was really cool. It was, I mean, all 15 fans or whatever hanging out in the lobby and talking to him. It was probably and, us three and, and, and the band Vago, who I think opened up for them. They're friends of mine. And, and Danny is... And Rob from Saddle Creek, because he was there too. Okay, and Danny from Vago is a huge Tommy Stenson fan, so I think they weaseled their way onto that show. I, and I've, I've met Tommy, I've met Paul on the bus. I've met uh, Tommy a number of times. I have a friend who's a friend of his, so I, I've met him a little bit. And I met the entire band in 89 and had my infamous Paul Westerberg experience, which I told I told St. Vincent, because we had to talk about meeting our idols or whatever, and I mentioned it in this podcast, but this is a story that I, I will tell now for the purposes of this show, because it's appropriate to the replacements. And it has been told back to me by a people who didn't know that I was the subject of the story. Really? Okay. This is Pleased to Meet Me, and, uh, or not Pleased to Meet Me, I'm sorry, Don't Tell a Soul. <clears throat> it's May of 89, we are placing for Peony Park. And I got to, and I had um, a black and white 8x10 glossy promo photo, you know, that the record companies had. I brought it out to Slim, he signed it, Chris Mars signed it, Tommy Stinson signed it, got my picture taken with all of them, they were all super cool. Westerberg's holding court at this table with a couple of girls standing around him. And I walk up, and I give him the photo and ask him to sign it, and he fucking rips it up mm. into pieces and just chucks it in the air. And I'm just, like, devastated, right? This is my fucking hero, and he's such a dickhead. I can't believe he just did that. And everyone around is just staring, like, wow, did you see what he just did to that kid, you know? 
and that's what people have said, like, yeah, this kid looked like so devastated. And I was <laughs> like, I was that kid. Yeah, that was me, dumbass. So then he goes to me, he goes, uh, so what else you got? And I had a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, like I had my a musician magazine with that. I had some records and stuff. But I didn't really want to give him anything because yeah. I thought he was going to just fuck it up. So I begrudgingly gave him the musician magazine and he takes it. And then he like opens it and he just starts signing his name like 20 times in the magazine, turning the page, signing it, turning the page, signing it. And then he starts talking to me about something. And of course I ask him a kiss question. So I'm like, how come, you know, of all the covers you used to do, why did you actually record Black Diamond? And he's like, well, when we were making Let It Be, we recorded like about 20 different covers. That was the one that I knew the most of the lyrics to, so that's the one that made it on the album. <laughs> so it was totally insignificant, really. I mean, it was like, it was a song that they chose, but it was the reason it made it on the record was really just because that he got the lyrics the, the most, right? Yeah. So then it was nice, and then I was totally torn about the whole experience. And then I posed for a picture with him, but no, that was my uh, that was my negative Paul Westerberg experience. And I've never I've never met him since. I've never spoken to him or anything. Had the opportunity, and I kind of was like, I mean, I love this guy, but I don't want it to be been down that again road because before. I've already been there. And like, I you know I, I got past it obviously because here we are, 25 years later, and I I still love the band, but. Man, that was rough. I still feel like there's an emotional chip on your shoulder. <laughs> I'm still pissed. I, I don't know him. that you're fully recovered. <laughs> I, want to, I want to tell him. And I may be going to the show in Arizona. Uh, they're playing a festival in Arizona in September. And um, and uh, there's a chance, a chance, I may be able to get backstage. I'm debating if I get the opportunity, if I can corner Westerberg, about telling him the story. Or would that be just like some whiny thing I've been holding on to for 25 years? And he'll think I'm like an asshole for bringing he's it like, up. He's like, get over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be very cathartic for you. It could. Or he'll just and mock you further. he'd be super nice about it and be like, you know what, man? <laughs> I remember that story. I remember that. I didn't know that was you, you know, or something like that. You know, that. seeing him on stage during these reunion tours, he just looks happy like he's having a good time, though, too. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it, it's not like a train wreck. It's not no. like him. I mean, obviously, you saw maybe something different, but we saw both. But, you know, when we were in Denver... I mean, they was just they were having a great time, and they seemed to really be enjoying yeah, well, that's playing the songs. I thought Chicago, they were having a blast. And playing yeah. with each other. So, I mean, I think he's probably, although, again, Coachella, I mean, he was obviously telling them to F off. He's still got his, well, he's still got his he's, attitude. He but, still has yeah. that attitude. He still, he still doesn't give a shit, really. He's not there to impress you. It's like, if you like them for what they do, more power to you. He's into it. If you don't, like, fuck you at this point. I mean, I think he... He did have that period where he really cared, I think, what people thought. Like that sort of don't tell a soul right. into all shook down, his, the beginning of his solo career. And you can tell once he switched to that grandpa boy, yep. that he, that's when the, 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 the switch turned. And it's like, you know what, that, that mainstream success is never going to happen. I might as well just do something that I like now and stop trying so hard. And everything he's made since then, the grandpa boy stuff, the solo stuff, you know, the stereo, mono, all of that shit has been so much better than his stuff he did right after the replacement. I like that I first think. solo record a lot. Oh, I like it, and I like but, that. I like but, but when Grandpa Boy came out, that was exciting again. It's like, holy, you know, yeah. something different. And it was kind of pre, I mean, the internet was around, but it was pre a lot of the talking on the internet, communicating, so there was still a little bit of a mystery around it, you know, it wasn't so automatic. You, you had to put it on to realize, oh, oh yeah. yeah, it's, because I remember getting the promos at, uh, at Homer's, and we put it on, and we're like, you know, we kind of had a feeling, or somebody had told us, or maybe a rep had mentioned it. But once you put it on, you're like, oh crap, this is Westerberg going, going replacements. You know, he's going back to his, you know, roots. You know, yeah. Especially that the, the full length mm-hmm. uh, with MPLS and yeah. those. I mean, that's just like he's him on every instrument. He's even playing the drums, and he's not a good drummer. It's like all offbeat and stuff. But he's so fucking good. I mean, I, now. You saw in the, at the California show, at one of them, I think, that he, they played Psychopharmacology in the set, which is a Grandpa mm-hmm. Boy song.
second. Oh, was the second. Yeah. Because again, I'm proven wrong in my facts. I'm looking facts. at the set list now. Um, See, back in the old days with these discussions, we wouldn't have been able to look that up. <laughs> Good old kids. <laughs> Damn kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kids and their internet. First three songs were I Will Dare, Nowhere Is My Home. Um, then they did a, the only ones cover, Another Girl, Another Planet. Then and Nowhere Is My Home, that's another song that I always that I wanted them to do. Because it was on the Boink album at the time. That was the only place you could get it. Remember that record, Boink? It was a UK import that had... It had, it had that song unique to it, and then cuts off like Who Danny and, and Stink and stuff. But it was that song was so brilliant, and they would never ever play it live. It was like Westerberg said he didn't even know it when someone I knew asked him. He was like, I have no idea how that song even goes or whatever. <laughs> and then they played 13 of the 16 songs with Billy. So. Here's a good question. Who do you think? It, so we're going to the Minneapolis reunion, their first hometown show. And I mean, my, my head is swarming with the who's going to get up on stage with I, with the replacement. I don't care about anyone. I want Chris Mars to come up on stage, even if he doesn't play. I just want him to stand there with them and acknowledge that he was in that band. Like okay. he, I know he's an artist now, and he's great. His artwork yeah, is pretty is awesome. awesome. I mean, if I had a spare twenty five grand, <laughs> I would yeah. totally buy one of his pictures, no question. However. You know, it's it's tough when you I mean they can't get Bob because he's he's dead. Right. They can't get Slim because he's incapacitated and he can't play anymore. But Chris just doesn't want to. Right. And that's sort of why it's sort of like I just want Chris to want to at I've, least once. Yeah. I've got the infamous my buddy John in Minneapolis, mm-hmm. one of his buddies is friends with Chris Mars and he said he can't stand Westerberg. I mean and it's just there's like a, a hurdle he can't get it turned over. Turned out a so. damn lot of money so obviously yeah. he doesn't like you it. Certain monetary figures. I know I heard three riot festates was a million dollars. That's what I yeah, heard too. That's what I heard too. Yeah. But now they're not getting that. And they're not getting that. And, 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 and Coachella although Coachella has you know they have fuck you money. They have right. so much money. But they could have paid the replacements a lot of money to play in front of 300 people which is would be would almost serve them right you know like I wouldn't feel as bad for the replacements playing for a million dollars in front in. of 300 people, you know, I mean, why not? It's and they're better. only doing the festival circuit, they're not, there were rumors they were going to do an actual tour and, uh, and you know, do it like for real, like in smaller venues and stuff, but they're not going to do it, it's just going to Once, you get, the fe- once you get that money and be able to just float around on a weekend and get paid like that, why would you want to go back on a right. bus, you know what I mean? I'm saying Maha 2015. I, they want it. If yes. they're still doing yes. it, if they want it. Interesting. As the price keeps, it, oh, the price is going down. Yeah, they're, by, 20, yeah. by the time they're going to book Maha for 2015, their price tag won't be at... And the, you know, a third of a million dollars. Trey Brashear, are you show. listening? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's listening. And, they, and they'll <laughs> ask. They will. They probably yeah. ask this year. I guarantee they'll you want they probably did. So anyway, back, back to the St. Yeah. Paul show. I want to hear Chan Pauling from the suburbs playing Androgynous because he played the piano on it, Androgynous on the record. So, and I'm a big suburb. I was a big suburbs fan back in the day too. And the new suburbs a lot of guys stuff don't know. Yeah, I mean they've gotten back together and they sound really good. That new record's really good. Yeah, it went up so a few years ago. I want to see Dave Perner. I really do. I do too. I'm with I, you, man. I do. Um, I just think, he live in New Orleans now, or is he still in Minneapolis? Well, but why would he go up there? I mean, I, I don't know. why would they, why would half these bands play shows around? Martin you know. Well, yeah, I'd like to see Martin Zeller, but I don't. I don't think they even. They might not even know each other, really. I don't know. So that was that was a different. That was a different little scene. Yeah, yeah. replacements were already kind of a national. Yeah. Thing. I wanted to see Martin. I wanted to see the Gear Daddies open up. That's what I wanted to see. But I wish they would have got an older band to open up. That was who's opening up. I don't even know. Well, it's the Hold Steady and Lucero, which okay, and they're both yeah. great bands, but. And you know, I mean, God, I mean, holds Craig Ben's got to be pissing himself to get to up. Oh yeah, yeah. Place, he, he's you know? very, he's more excited yeah. than I would be to see him. Yeah. Um, no, I want Chris Mars. I just want to, I just want. I mean, you know, because he did. There was that photo that circulated of him in Westerberg um, when they signed a bunch of those songs for Slim stuff, and they were in the same room together, sitting there like not looking like they hate each other, you know, because <laughs> Westerberg, you, you can generally tell in his face, like if he just is not into it. Um, so I would just, I mean, he doesn't even have to play. I just want him to come up on stage and say, hey, this, you know, Chris Marsh or whatever, and let him take a bow Soak it in. or yeah. play with a tambourine or some shit. I don't even care. I just want him to get up there. You know, that's that's what I would like to see. But I'm not going to be at that show. I'm maybe show be at the Arizona show. Bands. No, I'm, I'm shocked that it had a show. I thought they'd show. have a show. I thought they would too, but I'm whatever. surprised they didn't do a, a surprise show, like First Ave or something. I, just I, unannounced, you know, it's... 
I'm surprised they didn't before the Riot Fest shows. I think everybody was expecting that in Minneapolis. I mean, I'm sure everybody in Minneapolis replacements fan was trying to find any clue as to when they're going to play First Avenue, you know. But yeah. yeah, they never did that. And, you know, who knows? They might do something like that before this show, too. But mm. I don't know. I'm going to be walk- looking around uh, around the, uh, the venues yeah. around there to see what's happening. You'll see you know, the you know. Minneapolis celebrities in the crowd. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know all the people from... From uh, I mean, except for Prince, of course, he won't be there. But hey. every other Minneapolis music celebrity, the Jayhawks, and um, you know, Cat or not, probably not Cat, but Lori from Babes, Babes and Toilet, Toilet, she'll for sure be there. Yeah. Um, and other guys, a lot of different bands. Obviously, the suburbs, suburbs guys. Plus, you know, there's a lot of you know younger Minneapolis bands, you know, too. I mean, I see Jerry Messersmith there, who I'm a big fan of. You might see, you know, who knows who's going to be out there. You know, so I wonder. I mean, it's kind of like the to do in Minnesota this year. It's the, the special thing. So I'm excited for it. I'm I am too. Yeah. Well, I'll maybe see him in Arizona, and that could backfire because it could be like an LA kind of crowd. I mean, you know, I. What's that festival called? I don't know. It's in <laughs> Tempe, I think. Is that near Phoenix? Yeah, that's just yeah, that's where Arizona State is. It's like September 27th. Because their influence was probably a lot more Midwest than it was anywhere else. Was. A lot of those, a lot of those bands, you know, twin. A lot of Minneapolis scene like back when I was in college at the Drumstick, you'd catch all the Minneapolis <coughs> bands coming through to Kansas City, Denver, you know, heading east, west, north, south out of there. So yeah, that's where we you get know, all the great. Now, bands. Did they ever play places like the Howard Street Tavern or anything like that? Does they ever play there? I don't remember them ever playing there. I mean, I think they played the Drumstick a couple times. And then, were there then, any other like really underground places in the early '80s in Omaha? I mean, I know that. REM played a whole bunch of like underground. Well, they shows. played the twenties, and then they played the Howard Street. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Digital sex. The 20s Who's that? The strip club? Yeah. Well, I remember seeing awesome. the suburbs at the at the twenties. Really? Like, Digital down, sex there. opened up for the REM at at the twenties. Yeah. Derek was it also was it a strip club then, or it was just a rock club? It was called the twenties. I don't know. It was a strip joint at the time. It I was like, I, I wasn't around. Yeah. yeah, I saw the suburbs. There it was one of the weirdest shows. It was like a Halloween show. Oh, nice. It was, it was find it? bizarre, right. bizarrely fun though. Yeah. It, it didn't look like a very good festival. Like it was one of these deals where I was going to fly in Saturday morning. They play Saturday night. Uh, you showed it to me. It looked horrible. Actually. Yeah, it was very bad. <laughs> it, was, it was like nobody else good on it except for the replacements. But, well, I don't know. Unless anyone else has gotten any sort of anecdotes or anything, I, I, I mean, we've been talking for almost an hour, so I think we've got. You know, it's it so natural. It's just like we were sitting in the bar having a couple of drinks, talking about the replacements. And all, you know, oh it's wait, like, it's that's like, exactly what yeah, it was. it's like we would have done anyway. <laughs> well, all right, gentlemen, I'm going to turn off the mic. <laughs> off to St. Paul. Well, there you go. Hope you got something out of this discussion. I think it's uh, it was pretty interesting. Uh, as you see, I, I interspersed uh, bits of music from the reunion shows. Those are all from the various shows, either the first two nights of Riot Fest or a couple of the band's appearances at Coachella in 2014. And I'm going to close out the show right now with the band's performance of I Will Dare, which I said at the time was my favorite replacement song when I was doing the interview. I've already changed my mind. I think today I'd probably say Bastards of Young, or perhaps uh, Color Me Impressed, Um, maybe Skyway, I don't know. But I Will Dare is a safe, uh, not a safe choice. What am I talking? I'm correcting myself here. It's a great choice. And you know what? This is a great uh, version of it from just a few uh, months ago in California at the Coachella Festival with uh, Paul, of course, being his usual humorous self. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. This has been the Dark Stuff Podcast. cover band we are the cements
Transfer of data is complete.